Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose lands we meet. And today, for us, uh, it's the ancestral lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Thank you for joining us. Now, this acknowledgement is particularly important in the context of health and medical research. And I have a quote here. Social and emotional well-being is the foundation of physical and mental health for Indigenous Australians. It's a holistic concept that encompasses the importance of connection to land, culture, spirituality and ancestry, and how these affect the well-being of the individual and of the community. But as a group, Indigenous Australians continue to experience poorer health outcomes than non-Indigenous Australians in some areas. Throughout our work with Hassanda and the People Research Data Commons, we've heard consistent feedback that this gap is an issue. It's an issue that Australian researchers see as a priority to address and that enabling culturally appropriate and equitable research is foundational to the design of research infrastructure and that empowering communities with their own data allows them to take charge of addressing priority issues of health and well-being. That's one thing to think about as we go into this afternoon's discussion. So I'm Rosie Hicks, I'm the CEO of the Australian Research Data Commons, ARDC, which is enabled by the Federal Government's National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, or ENCRIS. Our mission to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis, and retention of high quality data assets. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the second of the 2023 ARDC Leadership Fora. And as you know, well, I hope you're in the right place, uh, to discuss considerations for trusted research environments for health and medical data. Virt excuse me, I'm just going to do this. I've been given my speaking notes. There we go. Not pretending. Uh, virtual research environments that allow collaboration between researchers across geographical, institutional, and potentially jurisdictional boundaries. Secure research environments that provide additional technological controls to help ensure the platforms that researchers use working on their data are safe and protected from unintended use. But trusted research environments go beyond this. And they help to ensure that the expectations of all research stakeholders are met. This means that not only can the service provider have confidence in the usability and security of the technology for research, but the data custodians and the people whose data is being accessed have confidence there is robust governance and oversight of how their data is used, and that this kind of research infrastructure meets their legal and ethical, and in fact, cultural expectations. These safe data spaces address the needs of the public sector, the private sector, the research sector, and civil society. They allow researchers to work on priority health and well-being issues for the health system and for health consumers. ARDC's People Research Data Commons provides national scale data infrastructure for health and biomedical research and research translation. You will know the health and health research system is a complex multi-stakeholder environment with multiple government jurisdictions, a myriad of health services, a thriving private sector, several national research facilities, and a wide range of research institutions. I believe that would go under the description of a wicked problem. So today's forum uh, is really looking at how we can simplify, transform the way the researchers contribute to this health system. The Data Commons builds national level capability, coherence and coordination in data strategy and discovery, trusted research environments, data integration, and advanced analytics. 
We look forward to catalyzing the public debate, envisaging for this system a more coherent framework for trusted research environments across those many players in the health system. Today's discussions will inform our own national infrastructure programs and partnerships. I would like to recognize there are a number of organizations that have developed solutions in this space and are working further to meet the evolving needs of researchers, including importantly, our fellow NCRIS capability PHRN, which supports a number of data linkage units around the country and environments in this space, including BioPlatforms Australia, research organizations, research infrastructure organizations, and Commonwealth and state-based health agencies. I suspect that all of you will belong to one of those on the list. Let me know if I've missed you out. We're committed to supporting Australia's researchers using trusted data environments to address the grand challenges. So now I am going to hand over to our facilitator for today, uh, Joanna Batston. Joanna is the inaugural director of the Monash Future Data's Data I'm going to get this bit right. The inaugural director of the Monash Data Futures Institute, responsible for bringing together data science and AI capabilities from across Monash University. An exceptional thought leader in the development and application of AI and data analytics. A passionate person for the benefits of AI in driving lasting and transformative change for social good. But particularly, I'm very grateful for Joanna's contributions to the ARDC uh, Research Advisory Committee, Research and Technology Advisory Committee. Um, it's a committee that has truly partnered with us as we go through evolving the thematic research data commons and Joanna's wisdom has been of great benefit to us. Um, I know it's only a tiny part of the many, many hats you wear, Joanna, but we're very grateful. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you here uh, to guide us through this afternoon's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie, for those kind words of introduction. And it's great to see everybody here in the room. And I know we have a large audience online as well. So welcome. Public trust in science is essential in a range of fields of inquiries, and not least those where we work with personal data. In the fields of medical and health sciences, the development of innovation and new knowledge generally requires us to assess accurate, reliable, and at times very sensitive information. The ARDC is seeking to address these challenges of data privacy and data security by exploring trusted research environments for health and medical data. Trusted research environments, often called TREs, another TLA, three-letter acronym for us to remember, uh, these TREs are highly secure and controlled computing environments that allow researchers to gain access to data in a safe way. They're also often called safe data havens or secure data environments. TREs are not entirely new, though. In the United Kingdom, TREs have been used to share sensitive data since at least 2013. And more recently, we've seen governments around the world use TREs as a secure long-term solution for research and clinical needs and clinical use of sensitive health data. And within Australia's national collaborative research infrastructure, the Population Health Research Network has, has developed secure access facilities with both state and federal governments to provide linkage of population administrative data sets. At the Commonwealth level, the new data access scheme provided by the Office of the National Data Commissioner includes notions of trusted data environments provided by accredited data service providers. These trusted research environments are also implicitly a baseline capability of research institutions and researchers to be accredited users, including pro probably many of you in the room as well. Several solutions are now emerging across Australia and internationally to meet these needs. 
However, the needs of researchers are also changing and evolving to incorporate new technologies and new ways of conducting research. In my role as the director of the Monash Data Futures Institute, we're particularly interested in the application of new technologies, particularly data science and artificial intelligence, as it relates to the way that we think about access and analytics associated with data. And more broadly at Monash, we're very focused on looking at the opportunities with the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine and other groups across Monash including our e-research teams, our Monash Helix, Helix technology platform teams, to think about how we protect and secure sensitive research data. Ensuring health data can be analyzed in a secure, trusted research environment is critical to enable us to maintain public trust in the research process while enabling researchers to bring together a range of data types from a variety of different data sources. I'm delighted to be able to facilitate a fascinating panel of speakers today. We have speakers from a wide range of perspectives, including from, from industry, from a platform provider, from researchers who use research platforms, and I'm sure you'll enjoy a very lively discussion on trusted research environments this afternoon to understand what's already in place and what are the emerging trends and directions in this field. So before I introduce our panelists and ask them to come to the stage, I'd encourage all of you, as you listen to this afternoon's discussion, to think through how would you address answers to these types of questions. What do you see as the opportunities and challenges presented for trusted research environments? What do you think are the best practices today in trusted research environments? And interestingly, how can we facilitate patient involvement and input to develop trusted research environments that address their research priorities and interests as well? So we're in for a very lively discussion. In terms of the format for this afternoon's event, each panelist has been asked to speak for about five minutes, uh, introducing their own perspectives and experience and the work that they do today in their respective organizations to look at trusted research environments. And so I'd like to invite our four panelists to come up and join me on the stage now. Uh, Dr. Charmaine Tan, Professor Dougie Boyle, Professor Jim Buttery, and Associate Professor Bernie Pope, if you would all come on up and take a seat um, on, on the stage here, and we'll get into the panel discussion. So I'm going to introduce our, our first panelist, and then we'll go one by one, and I'll introduce each one of them in more detail um, as they start. So our first panelist will be Dr. Charmaine Tam, and Charmaine represents the industry voice in today's panel discussion, so we're delighted to have her join us today. Uh, Charmaine's a senior consultant in the ecosystem business unit at Telstra Health. And within that role, she oversees an aggregated data and, data and insights research program to help address population health and research needs. Prior to joining Telstra Health, Charmaine led a clinical analytics team that worked with millions of routinely collected electronic medical records within a metropolitan health service. And she also spent 10 years working in health and medical research and so she's very passionate about safe and judicious use of routinely collected medical records to drive health outcomes. So, Charmaine, looking forward to hearing your insights. Thank you for joining us. Um, hi, everyone, um, and thank you for the introduction, Joanna. Um, perhaps before I start, um, just perhaps to give you a bit of a context of Telstra Health um, as an organization and the types of work that we do. Um, so, um, Telstra Health is Australia's largest digital health company. Um, over the past 10 years or so, we've um, acquired and also developed um, a range of um, patient management software spanning hospitals, pharmacies, um, uh, residential aged care facilities, as well as um, primary care. 
Um, we also run a number of core health services um, on behalf of the Australian Federal Government. So we also run the National Cancer Screening Registry, 1-800-RESPECT, um, um, and also a um, electronic prescription exchange. So that's kind of um, a flavour of some of the um, software that we provide um, across the patient care continuum. Um, just to give you an idea of the kind of the scale scale of the interactions that occur through our software in primary care alone. So each year we process about 80 million um, consultations through um, primary care. Um, three out of four of those um, interactions um, will result in a prescription. Um, one in four will result in a pathology or an imaging request, and one in five will result in a specialist referral. So that's the kind of magnitude of data that we're dealing with just in primary care alone. Um, the ecosystem business unit that I'm part of, um, we work with partners across the whole health ecosystem that are beyond our customer base. Um, and so we partner with you know, researchers, um, pharma, government, whoever is interested in leveraging the reach of the information within our platforms. Um, and we partner with them to drive their own health, their own missions and their own health outcomes. So we do that in a number of different areas. Um, we do that in the patient engagement space. So whether you're interested in looking at the appointment book or payments, payment providers. Um, we do that in the clinical communication space. So looking at secure um, message delivery between from point to point between clinicians. Um, we do it for um, also for clinical trials and health programs. So we identify cohorts of patients that are eligible for different trials or health programs and serve them electronic um, clinical decision support in the software um, in order to you know, reach those, those um, patients. Um, we, and we also have this de-identified aggregated data program um, that we look after as well. Um, so that's just to give you an idea of, you know, the, of, what, of the types of capability that we do. And I guess you might be wondering, you know, why is Tulsa Health interested in you know, a, participating in a panel on secure research data environments? And I think um, you know, traditionally you know, there's been these silos between academia, health services and industry. And um, you know, having you know, worked in these different areas myself, I can see the opportunities and the challenges in each, in each of these areas. And I think the more opportunities we have you know, to come together and bring together these different perspectives, you know, the more um, we're able to keep on continuing to provide you know, a safe, quality um, healthcare system for Australians. So I'm really happy to you know, share this perspective um, on what we do in the data space for Telstra Health. Thank, thank you. I'm not sure if this, mic, this microphone's on. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Charmaine. Uh, so our next panelist is Professor Dougie Boyle. And Dougie's a professor and academic specialist at the University of Melbourne uh, with a specialty in health data science. He has a leadership position as well within Chancellery around digital research academic engagement. And he's the director of the Department of General Practice and Primary Care, Health and Biomedical Research Information Technology Unit. Uh, Dougie's role on this panel today is, is representing one of uh, those of a platform provider. And so within the large health informatics team, he is the data steward of a repository of de-identified research data, uh, holding data on over 5 million Australians. And so I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about that this afternoon. So thank you, Dougie, for joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you, Joanna. Um, <clears throat> well, look, it's, it's great to be here. As you say, today I'm representing a, a platform provider. Um, some of the things I do get involved in are, are around access to the uh, research data from a stewardship capacity and things like that. Um, and hence, when I sort of think of myself as a platform provider, it's often uh, around that much wider engagement um, that we're needing right across universities, for instance, with, uh, um, uh, with, with, uh, with industry. Uh, so, uh, so it's great to have you here and be on the panel uh, today with you. Um, so look, I really got involved in providing platforms really out of what I see as an increasing need here in Australia, privacy, uh, consent, governance, cybersecurity, all these things are more and more uh, becoming important, not just within small niche research communities and, and industry. This is, this is about people um, and that's hugely important. And in fact, the definition of what is sensitive and sensitive data is an interesting one. 
because uh, certainly the data that I often work with is de-identified, but when you're dealing with millions of records, um, you know, there are huge sensitivities still on all of that. Um, and I want to see how we can maximise um, the use of data for research. You know, we actually need to undertake research and we need to be able to see translation happening on that to improve outcomes for all. Um, we have great challenges there with uh, the number of breaches that are happening in different organisations, um, uh, which is happening not because organisations are necessarily lax, but there's an awful lot of more resources being on the dark web and things. It's actually very hard to secure data these days. Um, so it's, it's really important that we can try and take that burden off of researchers who don't have skills in that space. They're, they're there to answer research questions, not to keep an environment safe. Um, so we've got a bit of a transition to do there and we've got things like the ONDC as was, was mentioned earlier on, uh, looking at access to government data in particular, which is changing university roles potentially in this space. Um, and we'll come back to that and I'm sure we'll discuss it some more. So anyway, that, that's me. I'm here to try and see how we can provide the platforms and uh, I've worked around the provision of Erica, um, a, a platform that we've developed ourselves in our department, which is based on Nectar infrastructure. Um, and the university is, has got a separate uh, secure research environment that has been launched in the last few months um, that uh, some of my colleagues are actually here in the audience for that today. Uh, and are doing a great job. So looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Dougie. So our next panelist uh, is on the panel to represent an academic user of research data. So Professor Jim Buttery, thank you for joining us, Jim. Jim is the chair of Child Health Informatics at the University of Melbourne and also head of the informatics research group at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Uh, Jim's research interests include vaccine safety, infectious diseases, epidemiology, and clinical child health informatics. He's also the Chief Clinical Research Information Officer at the Royal Children's Hospital. He's a co-director of the Global Vaccine Data Network and serves as a member of the Advisory Committee on Vaccines for the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So thanks for joining us today, Jim. Thanks very much, Joanna. Um, <clears throat> I work at the Centre for Health Analytics, which is a Melbourne Children's Campus initiative. Melbourne Children's Campus is a combination of the University of Melbourne, the Royal Children's Hospital, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, and also the Royal Children's Hospital Foundation. And our mission is quite simple. It's to improve child health through the innovative use of data, which gives us a fairly broad remit. My, um, our work, as you've heard, um, given that we formed during COVID was very much public health related rather than very specifically hospital related and we're also responsible for vaccine safety surveillance in the state of Victoria which is all ages. Um, I might take a step back before I talk about trusted research environments. I'm an, an infectious disease doctor and I became interested in health data when I was sitting on a government committee, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee. And PBAC makes recommendations to government about whether to fund or oh, sorry, whether or not a medicine or a vaccine is a good investment for the Australian taxpayer to support. And submission after submission, in good faith, showed absolutely terrible amount of quality of the Australian burden of the particular illness that this medicine was designed to improve. Not because the people doing the submission were doing a terrible job, but because that data was just not available. And I knew that that data was sitting there and if only could be made available. And trusted research environments such as Dougie's are the research environments that suddenly mean that in normal interventions in healthcare, we can begin to understand either the burden of an illness or the difference a medicine may take at a real population level rather than a relatively artificial clinical trial level that occurs in a limited number of people with very set exclusion and inclusion criteria. So it's really offered a way for us to really understand the impacts on our health system. So we use trusted research environments in a variety of ways. One, we 
use them in collaboration with the state government where we're able to link major statewide data sets to understand the interaction between vaccines and health outcomes. We also use it in collaboration with um, uh, external partners, either private industry or other organisations, which enables us to go in and access uh, large-scale de-identified data and ask questions of it in a secure way, um, which gives those organisations the, ab the ability to feel confident that their data is safe by giving us access to near population level data. So for us that represents one, a privilege that we're able to trust it, but two, excitement that we can now get access to the level of data that enables us to inform real decisions. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, our next panelist will give us some opening commentary is Associate Professor Bernie Pope. Uh, Bernie, thanks for joining us. Bernie's, uh, Bernie's from the University of Melbourne and his background is in computer science and bioinformatics. And his research focuses on applying computational techniques to biological questions, especially related to human genomics and cancer. Uh, he's the lead bioinformatician at Melbourne Bioinformatics and associate director for the human genome informatics at the Australian BioCommons. And so I'm sure we'll hear some interesting insights from a genomic data consideration perspective from Bernie. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, Joanna. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to ARDC for inviting me. Um, so I, I kind of have two roles. Um, on the one hand, I'm a researcher at the university, and I'm interested in cancer genomics, um, particularly using um, genomics to identify the drivers for aggressive disease. Um, and on the other hand, I work for the Australian Biocommons, um, where we, we try to d develop digital research infrastructure at a national scale, um, connected to international efforts. Um, and um, in, in our team, in the Human Genome Informatics team, we're focused on um, genomics and more generally omics technologies um, related to human data. And I think the first thing to point out with omics data, of course, is that, um, well, for one thing, it's, it's incredibly large per sample. Uh, an individual whole genome sequence is approximately per individual about 100 gigabytes. And now there are projects with hundreds of thousands of those. So if you do the maths, you work out it's petabytes or exabytes of data just for a project. So it's big and expensive. Um, and it's also very complicated. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing about omics data is that um, it's very identifying, um, particularly for if you're looking at DNA for an individual, that's unique. Their, their sequence of their genome is unique to that individual. Um, uh, it's the one thing. Uh, it also um, connects to their relatives. So if you learn things about an individual, you also happen to know some things about um, their, their kin um, as well. And also, omics data brings with it all sorts of fantastic opportunities for healthcare and improving um, uh, translational medicine. Um, there are also some risks and things we need to be concerned with, including the potential for discrimination. Um, and that could come out in many different ways. It could be around access to insurance. It could be about access to um, employment, or it could be di discrimination on other levels. Um, it could also um, relate to kinship, as I mentioned already. So if you identify information about an individual, you happen then to potentially know things about their relatives as well. Uh, and there's all sorts of issues around that that we need to be cautious with. And so um, in our work at the Australian Biocommons, when we're looking into digital research infrastructure, I have to say that um, trusted research environments are not something that we are advanced in in Australia. Um, but it's um, on our radar and it's something we're very interested in looking into. So I wanted to highlight probably the, the most advanced use of trusted research environments in the world, which is through Genomics England. Um, and if you look up Genomics England, you'll see they have about 100,000 human genomes in their data set. That consists of about 30,000 cancer-related genomes and about 90,000 rare disease genomes. And on about 90,000 of those individuals, they have detailed clinical and demographic data. Um, with their trusted research environment, no personal identifying information can leave the system. So there's an airlock mechanism whereby researchers can log in, do their analysis, and then what they take out of the system is downstream analysis results, which is carefully curated. Um, thinking about the advantages of such a trusted research environment, that there are many advantages. One is that it provides a single point of control for, for the security um, arrangements for technology, so we don't have a very 
um, wide surface area to look after. That's essentially a single point of access into the system. Um, another major advantage, I think, particularly with demonstrated by Genomics England, is that it actually enables research on very rich genomic and linked demographic and clinical data, probably more so than you would normally expect in the research environment. Um, because of those controls around how that linked clin clinical and de demographic data is used, it enables actually detailed linkage across the genomic data, the clinical phenotypic demographic data for the individual participants, and also public health records, um, which is a, a quite an interesting feature and makes it very appealing from the point of view of a researcher. Um, I think it also, as Rosie and Joanna said at the beginning, it encourages public trust uh, in the use of this data. Um, and it also gives control for individuals um, about their, their data that's used in the system and also enables them to understand how it's being used. And I, I think if we looked at the Genomics England platform as an exemplar, I think it's um, a really excellent example of how we might be able to do this in the, in the human genomic space. It also points to an interesting fact about it, which is it's a very large data set which means that it's worth investing and it's quite presumably uh, quite an expensive platform to develop and so on, but it's very w well worth investing in for such a large data set. And maybe later on in the discussions we'll talk about some challenges around that as well and so how, how do you connect, how does Genomics England and other things happening around the world, how would they, how would you do an analysis across these systems? I won't mention that now, but that's something that's on our mind as well. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Bernie. So you can tell we've got some really interesting perspectives and backgrounds and different representation on the panel here. So I'm going to kick off with some questions to get us started in, in the next phase of Q&A. But I'd encourage you to think about questions you may have for the panel. And I know we've got an, on, an online audience as well. So please think about questions if you're online as well and the team will feed them up to us. So I'd like to kick off. Each one of you has talked about both challenges and opportunities. And often when we think about trusted research environments, we might leap immediately to what technology do we need? But I'm actually interested in stepping back and sort of like to get your perspectives, certainly for those of you who are platform providers as well as platform users, what do you think are the key challenges in delivering these trusted research environments? Is it the technology or is it the people? Or is it something else? What are, what are some of the challenges that you have to address on a daily basis? Maybe I'll start with you, Dougie. All right, I'll kick that one off. <laughs> um, look, I think, um, of course, there are human challenges um, out there. But in terms of actually delivering a platform for safe research, there's a couple of interesting observations here. There isn't really a fixed definition of what a secure research environment or a trusted research environment actually is. Um, so I, I, I think there's often for us a consideration of what technology we're going to have to put in place, you know, how far do we take it? And usually what it really means is you want researchers to be able to work within an environment where they, they cannot get the data out except through a very controlled manner. In fact, can't get the data in either. And there might be audit trails in there. Um, but if you think about research and where the responsibilities lie, I thought I'd like to just sort of focus on that for a minute. Um, because, you know, I, I get involved in human research a lot, and we have to put in grant applications um, according to the NHMRC and follow the guidelines and the principle uh, putting the ethics application is. In, has certain responsibilities and even legal responsibilities and the universities have responsibilities. So the interesting thing is if you're a platform provider, what's your responsibility in that? Uh, so that's a kind of an interesting one um, because if something goes wrong and the data does get out, um, how do you escalate that for instance? So some of our challenges are of course trying to put the firewalls and the protections around the data and the standard operating procedures as well as the cyber security and the penetration testing. Um, but for me, one of the other challenges there is then uh, making sure that we have sufficiently ro robust processes uh, um, in place and open processes to deal with things when things go wrong. Um, so that's the interesting thing is that we think we're building secure environments and we do, but 
there's still a human angle in there. Um, and we need to appreciate that, uh, that, that this isn't always perfect. And it might be as simple as uh, someone giving access to the wrong person to data in a research trial. Uh, sort of thing that's easily done. The important thing is the transparency around the process um, um, after that. Um, it's also something where you, you, you need a certain scale of organisation to try and undertake maintaining these. Um, uh, you, know, you need to be able to make sure you've not got a single point of, of you know, single point dependency on delivering aspects of this technology. If it's all going to fail, um, you know, where do you go with that? Uh, you know, so our projects, our enclave, we've had approximately 30, 35 projects go through. Um, uh, so we, we've got an awful lot to think about in that in terms of cyber security. And our university think about the university's reputational risk. So that then flows down onto the providers of the, the environment. They're having to deal with the university wanting to ensure the protections are there. But funding envelopes are limited as well. So I'll leave it there. There's lots of other perspectives, I would think. But, uh, yeah, thanks, Dougie. Um, I wondered if any of the other panel members wanted to chime in. Maybe, Jim, you're a user of a platform. Do you share those perspectives on some of the key challenges, or do you see other things at play here? Uh, I mean, I think everything Dougie says is, is correct. As users, and especially early on, in periods where we needed to access linked data for public health research, the almost uniformly as users of data rather than uh, platform providers, the longest time is actually building the relationship with the providers of the data so that they trust you enough to actually provide access. My, uh, the first data linkage project I was involved with, we got an ARC grant for three years and the federal government approved the use of the linked data two years after the grant finished. Um, <coughs> the, my personal record is six years from initiating contact with a, an independent industry partner. I went through three managing directors, three chief medical officers, and after I gave up, um, the notification the data was now available arrived in my inbox. And it, it just takes time and patience and providing all the information. And you have to be aware that organisations, uh, most organisations are not there for research. And you just need to carefully build that relationship, make sure you're answering all of their queries in a way that is helpful for them to justify to potentially sceptical board members. Um, uh, everything else is, is, is certainly a challenge, but that's probably the biggest real challenge is building that relationship over time and maintaining that trust. Thank you. I mean, you talked about trust in relationships. You also made reference there to industry players. Um, Charmaine, you're our industry representative on this panel. From a perspective of Telstra Health, um, how, you know, what are some of the considerations that you need to think about when you're trying to build those trust relationships with researchers that you're trying to serve? Yeah, so I guess those points that Jim raised were exactly it. I mean, it is, it, it, even in industry, we need to build those trusted relationships and they do take time and we have, you know, security protocols that we go through, but it is really the time to reach comfort between two different parties um, about, uh, uh, for using this information. Um, in, in particular, um, I guess just to make the point, you know, with health, with with the health and um, with the data that is captured within our our software, um, there are many stakeholders that are involved. That are involved. There's you know the patient, the clinician, the practice, the um, pathology provider or the imaging provider, um, and there's us as software vendors. So as software vendors, you know, we're responsible for you know, storing, securely s storing that information on behalf of our customers, but we ourselves don't have right of use of that information for secondary use cases. Um, so, um, you know, the trust that our customers have in storing that software and, and not using that information is, um, is, is incredibly high. We don't want to jeopardise that. Um, however, we, rec we recognise that there are needs in the broader health ecosystem to derive insight from that 
that data. Um, and so some of the use cases that Jim described when he was on the committee, you know, asking, you know, the prevalence of certain conditions, you know, in the population, you know, we, you know, we have developed a consent and governance model um, to answer those types of pop to answer those types of population health requirements. Um, some of the um, ways that we address those types of questions um, is we have a data governance model. Some of the principles of that are, um, you know, we capture um, we capture patient and clinician consent. So in our in our patient management systems, we store um, consent for my health record alongside other other um, similar programs. And in that, we capture the patient and clinician consent for use of the data for secondary purposes. Um, and that's to provide transparency for our customers. Um, we also um, d collect dynamic consent every year, so we serve a clinical decision support message to, to clinicians to actively consent into a de-identified aggregated um, data program, and we keep that up to date every year, and then also we provide the insights from that research back to the clinician. Um, so that they see so that they see what um, the, the information is being used for. Um, we also only provide de-identified aggregated data, and I know that limits some of the use cases that we've talked about here. Um, but I guess you know what we found is you know we do that for safety. We we, we don't want to provide um, we don't want that risk of disclosing um, information. Um, you know, personal, de-identified or not information, and so, you know, our comfort level is aggregated, de-identified data um, as well. We also have a clinical governance unit who review every single use case that we do to make sure that those use cases are aligned to our mission and vision as an organisation, which is to enable um, connected healthcare for digital healthcare for all Australians. Um, so, you know, having said that, we've got this very robust model and we, and we want to partner with people who, are, who do require um, insights um, and who want to be able to action those insights within the software. So there's some, kind of some of the considerations that we, that we have uh, um, as an industry provider. I guess not everyone is interested in storing that um, sensitive information or, or, you know, they have the analytics resources to analyse it. Um, so we provide that service for, um, I guess, clients who are interested interested in, in those questions and the answers to those questions. And then also, um, when you want to feed back that insight, but we have the software where you can action those types of those findings that you're finding in research or otherwise. Thanks very much, Charmaine. And so I think what we're all hearing is different approaches, different solutions, different technologies that can be used as we think about building these trusted research environments. And so, what I'm hearing is it's probably not a one-size-fits-all and each one of you has different experiences and the types of technology solutions that you're involved in, but you're all focused on how do you address data governance, security, privacy, trust. Um, Bernie, you, you made reference a couple of times to the United Kingdom and I wondered if you could comment on what you see are perhaps best practices um, based on what you've seen in the United Kingdom and what you're involved in from a research perspective here in Australia, as you think about this particularly from the genomics perspective, is there anything you can say about best practices or what you think has worked really well in the United Kingdom and that we should aspire to emulate here in Australia? Yeah, um, it's a good question. So I was, I was thinking Again, um, we see trusted research environments as part of an ecosystem of technologies, um, and um, I think one of one of the great successes that Genomics England have had is um, their connection to the broader community um, uh, internationally. There's an organisation called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, or GA4GH, which has something in the order of 900 participating organisations and individuals, I think. Um, it's very large. Um, it's the community of uh, human genomics and omics researchers um, getting together and saying, um, we need to uh, standardise um, the things that we're doing. We need to work together. We don't want to build things in isolation. Um, and that includes um, interfaces, how these um, systems talk to each other, um, and so I think um, Genomics England has um, excelled in that regard. Um, another thing I was going to say, 
um, somewhat related to the previous question, but also I think that something that they would have had to solve um, there is in the genomic space, it's a very apparent to, to us that um, it's, a, it's an extraordinary number of areas of expertise that need to come together in order to build these kind of systems. If you think about it, we have the participants who donate their biosamples and their information, um, most importantly. Um, we have the clinicians who are involved with, um, in some cases, where patients are involved. Um, we have um, people who are experts in the legal, ethical and social aspects. We have people who are experts in um, digital infrastructure, computing, high performance computing, algorithms, data analytics, statisticians, mathematics. Um, we have um, all of the um, work that goes into project management, um, all of the work that goes into kind of funding and organizing these things. It's, it's, it's extraordinary um, in my mind, all the different disciplines and expertise that have to come together for these things. And so um, I'm, I'm an outsider to Genomics England. I, I'm only in some sense a user of their system. Um, but from what I can see, uh, I, I think that thinking about how we might do that in Australia, um, one of the big challenges is thinking about how do we bring all of these areas of expertise together. Um, there isn't anybody um, that covers all of those things in the level of expertise, you know, across all of them in the same way. No, of course, that's never going to occur. So we need to have those groups of people coming together to work together, and I think that's probably the big challenge for us. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Um, we have time for some questions from the audience. I wondered if uh, anyone has a question or a challenge from their own perspective and their own organization. Uh, there's a roving microphone that will be wandering around, so if you'd like to put up your hand and ask a question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Um, this is a question from our online audience, uh, and I've got two questions here, in fact, but I'll, I'll take one of them first. And the question is, how to ensure a platform is developed or delivered where the data is hosted uh, and has a big portfolio of tools to analyze the data? Now, that might be something for the platform providers or researchers. Dougie, do you want to tackle this one first? Yeah, thorny one. <laughs> um, I think it's something that um, providers of secure environments always struggle over as, is, are the sets of tools within the environment. Because one of the key things here is um, you, by definition, within these environments, you don't have access to the internet. Um, and one of the challenges is even some of the stats packages out there that, in, that are in common use don't have mechanisms for license uh, sign up that don't involve connecting to the internet. So there's some really fundamental problems. So certainly we see it within our environments a lot that we continually have to think about how can we take the software builds, try and get them running within it. Um, there has been some advocacy, I guess, from platform providers and through projects like ARDC's Ventures Around Erica to try and um, gain more of a group that can approach things like software providers to ask them to change the way the licensing models work, as an example. Um, but I think this just requires us to have more of a mature sector here in this space to, to help uh, drive that forward. But you can imagine if more and more research starts happening within secure environments, then vendors of software are going to think more about secure environments because that's where they want their, their tools to be used. Um, so just now it's, it's just an ongoing problem. I mean, uh, certainly once you've built an image with lots of different standard pieces of software on it, you can often uh, just you know, spawn these images for new instances of um, a, a secure environment. The question is just whether the licensing models would allow that to happen when you spawn more of them. Depends what you've licensed. And then the question is who pays then for the software that uh, someone actually wants to use on there. So you'll find some platforms will say these are the limits in the software we're by default would offer. Um, and there could be challenges if researchers want to use something with a sort of standard portfolio. Mm. Thanks. Anyone else want to weigh in on the question? I guess I can speak as a user of the platforms. I think very similar to Dougie, the limitation is largely around the software that's available within that. 
And our experience largely has been that the platform holders, uh, and I quite frankly was not aware of the licensing uh, internet issue, is that they're generally happy to install the software you want so long as, as, long as you can pay for, pay for the license arrangement. And the, the reality is, as a researcher, if you've got a member of your team who's comfortable with one pati particular statistics or software, it's actually cheaper to install that software than it is to train them to use an alternate version just because the opportunity cost of all of that time in learning, et cetera. And so, um, one, we try and get all of our team comfortable with using one particular software, it usually are. Um, but similarly, if, if we need to bring in software, most of the platform providers, so long as you're happy to fund it, are able to provide that within the environment. And that includes business intelligence software and other visualisation software. Can I just add to that, Jim? Sometimes researchers are wanting the data itself in certain formats like SQL or comma delimited. Uh, so sometimes actually just the format in which the data is requested can cause some challenges within the environments as well. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. We have one data partner who we're reliant on relatively near real-time data to do the work that we do. And that data is available in near real time uh, through a particular BI software. If we wanted a SQL update, which is easier for our team to work with, it, it's a, a lot of work and expense for the data provider to do that. And so we tend to compromise by accepting the limitations of viewing the near real time data through their BI software, which is harder to utilise our statistics programs through. Thank you. Bernie. Yeah, I can comment um, from the point of view of uh, a bioinformatics researcher as well in cancer and human genomics. Um, typically, um, the analyses we do, the sort of on the raw data, um, especially when, when talking about hundreds or thousands of individuals, we could be hundreds of thousands of CPU hours, maybe a million or more CPU hours of analysis on that data, which creates its own kind of challenges around orchestrating that because over, at large scale, things break all the time. Um, and um, that's just a fact of statistics. And so we need to, it's not just running a tool or a program, it's running a whole collection of tools in a big um, flowchart, if you like, um, over a long period of time. Um, in addition to that, um, if we're doing cross cohort analysis, one of the challenges with these large um, data sets is not introducing um, batch effects by accident by doing things in slightly different ways. Um, if you analyse it slightly differently over here and slightly over there, is the difference that you see um, an actual biological difference or is it actually just an artefact of doing things in a slightly different way in different environments? Um, and so there's a lot of pressure to actually use very controlled um, exact versions of software run in exactly the same way. In addition to the software and all the versions, there's every tool has dozens of parameters. Usually th those parameters are highly tuned. Um, as well, so there's a lot of expertise and knowledge comes into bringing those parameters onto the system and so on. So really what I'm trying to say is that, um, that one of the challenges faced potentially with trusted research environments is actually facilitating that kind of workflow um, in a highly secure environment. So getting both what the researchers want and need to do in order to get their results and have reliable results, but also not break the confines, as Dougie is also mentioning, of the actual research platform as well and the security. You've got another comment, Dougie, I can see. <laughs> it was just the kind of interesting, certainly in, the, in that genomics space, Bernie, just given the scale, um, a lot of Australian genomics is sort of at the national level, you know, sort of uh, because it's difficult for an individual organisation to try and undertake the research. So I guess there's slightly different challenges there, and if there are secure environments around genomics, maybe that needs done more at that sort of national collaborative level, whereas um, secure environments for other medical research or other forms of research are often at the institutional mm -hmm. level, whether it's government departments or the universities. Yes, so. absolutely. Um, <laughs> that, that's one of our motivations at Australian Biocommons is to have a, a national program for this work. And I will mention, um, importantly, at the same time, Australian Genomics um, is um, running a, a program called the National Approach for Genome Information Management and, 
and they've submitted through community consultation a large set of recommendations for doing exactly this kind of work and that's gone to the Department of Health and for consideration now. So it is, is worth saying that there's a lot going on at the moment trying to assemble this because we recognise it's, as you said, Dougie, a, a national and actually an in international um, thing that we need to solve. Great. We have another question here. We've got time for one question before the tea break. So if the roving mic can come down here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dougie Burney, just picking up on what you discussed uh, right here a um, few, few seconds ago, um, quite a lot of use cases around the world now picked up by the government, by Ministry of Health on secondary use of data, Look what's happening in Asia, Singapore, um, just big tender being picked up by one of the third party vendor, uh, look what's happening in Finland with the, and, and other countries. Um, do you see the same um, roadmap or path might take place here where uh, considering that it's required to bring a lot of different resources, people with a lot of different skills, uh, considering the undertake and considering the benefits which we'll be taking from the program like that under the umbrella of secondary use of data um, or utilization of big volume of data, the government will pick up ownership of developing such an environment. Um, because look, what's currently happening, there are a number of uh, spaces uh, where needs recognized and attempt made and some useful um, platforms are whether under consideration, been developed, but the scale is not there yet. So what's your thought? Um, will it happen? Will we'll, we'll be interested at the ministry level to pick, uh, to pick that um, challenge? Okay. Anyone want to like to offer an opinion on? I can, I can start on that. I think it's Natasha, <coughs> is it? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 one of our challenges, I guess, is our Australian governance, our government's model. Um, uh, but something exciting, I guess, is is the latest ONDC data place, uh, uh, a mechanism for trying to look at access to government data. Um, that's under the uh, Data and Transparency Act that's come through. Um, What's interesting about that is that normally government departments look after their data and don't allow it to go out anywhere else, but they can provide some environments to access data. So here, here in Victoria, we've got the Centre for Victorian Data Linkages and Vaults. Um, so what's just changed the things just a little bit is that with this new act, there's a role for universities in being a safe pair of hands around data. Uh, we still need to see exactly how that plays out. It's early days. So what I would say is at least we don't have a static environment. I think things are changing, but it doesn't seem to me that government's looking to centralise the capability, but it's looking to uh, certainly regulate and have mechanisms to provide a capability. Uh, so, you know, I'm thinking that this is something that could be important um, as we do things like industry engagement because I mean Charmaine and Telstra there's a problem there about who do you actually trust um, so you know what does that trust mean you know so under data place they've got concept of users as uh, and that might mean a, a university is a safe user of, of government data as an example but there's also the concept of accredited data uh, service providers ADSPs and that would be, for instance, a university providing additional services like linkage and bringing the data together, but under an umbrella of the fact that they've gone through an accreditation process to reach that level. So I'm sort of interested what that potentially could mean in the future to allow us to have uh, mechanisms to allow that wider access to data and the knowledge that there is some sort of accreditation and, uh, well, government has put it in place, so hopefully we can um, make use of that um, in the years to come. Thanks, Dougie. Um, we're going to take a tea break, but before we break, I'm going to encourage all of you again to think about your questions for when we come back. 
Um, when we come back, I'd like to pick up on this discussion about are universities providing a safe pair of hands for data? What about industry? Do we trust industry with our data? And what does that partnership need to look like? Do we trust government with our data? And how can we get access to data? So as we come back after the tea break, I'd like to pick up on this discussion around data. How do we get it? How do we manage it? How do we store it? How do we protect it? And what is that interplay between academia, government, and industry as we think about trusted research environments? So thank you so far for your participation and engagement. We're going to give you a short break now and reconvene at 3.20. before we broke for tea that I'd like to come back to this question around trust and trusted data. And Dougie, right before the break, you made reference to universities and the way that we potentially can think about universities as a trusted, safe pair of hands to share and manage and protect data. Um, industry, though, is chomping at the bit be able to enable and provide access to data, to store data. So I want to continue this conversation around the perspective of industry, around data, the perspective of a university data provider, around data, and some of the challenges that probably many of you in the room are facing when you think about data, particularly data operability. So, um, Dougie, you mentioned right before the break, providing them within a secure environment so there are slightly different models. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. I think it's, it's a, it, that if a university is offering a service, then perhaps you could trust it. But maybe another challenge is that sometimes the environments are coming from departments or faculties rather than the central university. So there's certainly a consideration there. Thanks. So, Charmaine, I'd like to turn back to you to get a bit of a perspective from industry, uh, both from your experience at Telstra, but also what you hear as you interact with other industry providers. And I know one of the questions we've talked a lot about is around what sort of reassurance do corporations need with respect to data privacy, and is there a risk of competition? Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so trust is paramount at Telstra Health, and that is trust from our customers. That is the top priority. Trust that you know we're their trusted partner to store the um, you know patient sen sensitive patient medical records. 
Um, so that's paramount to us. And in, in terms of you know being able to you know access that information for secondary use, I mentioned that we have you know this data governance policy where we actively request um, clinician consent and patient consent for taking part in in de-identified aggregated research. Um, so and also that they've got the control in that consent process. You know the transparency with being able to um, have that consent requested every year of them. So we we actively know that they want to participate um, and it, and then you know our use case is going through the clinical governance unit only providing de-identified aggregated data having said that when we do that and we and when we do this transparent consent and governance model when we ask the clinicians we have a 10% opt-in rate for participating in that kind of research um, so I think that kind of tells you that you know that's kind of the appetite of what um, our what our customers are responding back to us the, you know that's a you know when you when a trusted partner partner is asking, would you like to participate in de-identified aggregated research for these types of secondary purposes? Um, so I guess that's, that's kind of what we're working with. Um, and uh, we continue, you know, we, I think that's, you know, that's actually, it sounds low, but it's actually, I think, a fair reflection of where we're at in terms of society and trust in, in using that information for other purposes. So just to clarify, you said the, the opt-in rate is 10%. That's for clinician researchers? Yep. Yeah, or clini the clinicians um, who are, use, are using the platforms. Right, right, yeah. right. Um, I know we've got some questions online coming in, so um, Keith, if I can hand over to you for the next question. Yep, thank you. Um, so one question here is, uh, do large cloud providers have a role? And how does that impact trust from the public in their involvement in the research, i.e. them donating their data to such health data repositories? Ooh, so. interesting, interesting question. Cloud providers, how do you all feel about cloud providers? What role do they play? I know we had some discussion earlier around <coughs> the Nectar Research Cloud. What about commercial cloud providers? Where do they fit into the equation? Bernie, go ahead. I can comment on that. Um, so we, ab we absolutely think that commercial cloud providers can play an important role in the ecosystem um, that w we've mentioned before. So we think of trusted research environments as part of an ecosystem that would include um, commercial cloud. It would also include institutional um, high performance computing resources as well. Um, I should mention, just relating back to the previous question about um, industry um, partnerships as well, and I've been talking about Genomics England partly because it's the standout example for trusted research environments in, in human genomics. Um, their, their cloud platform is provided by a commercial partner. Um, and I won't mention names. You can look it up if you're interested to see um, what they do. And um, in one sense, you can see the, um, the ability to build those systems coming from industry as well. Uh, and they have a lot of expertise and capability to, to do that. How, how we kind of make sure that everything's going as we expect, I think is really related to something that's been mentioned a few times by many of the panel members, which is the governance structure that's built on top of this. And, and that, that's really critical. Um, and to get it right, it's difficult to do. And it does relate to also the previous question about the role of universities and other public institutions. For one, um, I think an important thing that universities provide and in similar institutions is they have longevity. Um, they're here for the infinite time, hopefully, um, and um, that, that, that is great because you can build long-running institutional um, governance structures on top of those, um, and, and so that's important. They're also open to scrutiny, and they should be seeking scrutiny from the public as well, um, and I think that's a useful thing too. But um, having said that, um, given that we can establish those, those governance structures, we in Australian Biocommons and more generally people in the community and the proposals that have gone to the Department of Health through NAGEM have advocated for the use of commercial cloud as one of the options in the ecosystem that we're trying to build. Yeah, Jim, you want to comment on that too? Thanks, you know, I completely agree with Bernie in that it's inevitable that uh, many of the large cloud providers have the sophistication that enable the existence of some platforms, but there are some critical limitations and it comes down to the governance. For example, the, the largest electronic health record provider, um, Epic, which is based in Wisconsin, has a massive um, shared de-identified data facility 
uh, called Cosmos, which carries the records of about 176 million individuals, overwhelmingly North American. No Australian organisation will take part in Cosmos because the data warehouse is not located within Australia. And so the upside is that we're certainly protecting our patients' data. The downside is that we're not capable of asking queries of this massive data set. And obviously the solution is to create a solution that enables respect of Australia's privacy laws to then potentially be able to take part in it. But there are, the governance is critical, but the opportunities are also concrete. But the other thing I just wanted to say that we've rightly pointed out in the last two questions, what do people think and what is the impression? And so the involvement of consumers is critical in all of this process. And the reason I mention it is that on our consumer panels, the perception of our consumer advocates is that the consumers are several steps ahead of where we as researchers or health professionals think they are. And it's critical that we involve them actively in this process so that we're appropriately having their views represented in not only in how we consider these things but also in how we design things. Uh, a question over here from the room. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, Emma Ball from Illumina, uh, wearing the industry lens um, and also thinking a little bit offshore. There are a number of tech bio companies that are now, or have been for some time, developing their own uh, proprietary data sets, very large ones. So uh, companies like Recursion, Tempest, I think they've got uh, 6, geno 6, 600,000 genomes. Uh, 23andMe, I think they've got over 13 million uh, genotypes matched clinical phenotypes. So what can we learn from some of these industry players is there best practice? Are there cautionary tales? How do we feel about that sort of data being in private hands? Stunned silence up here <laughs> on the panel. <laughs> so I think, uh, you know, it's an interesting question and that's, I'm very interested in the, in the industry perspective here. Um, it's not just universities that are aggregating data. Um, hospitals have huge amounts of data. I know we've got some of the Monash folks in the room here who work with a lot of health data through Monash Partners. We've got industry players that you've referenced that are building value-added data sets. Um, for me, the question becomes, again, back to trust. Do we trust a private company? How do we, how do we trust a private company as an individual? Uh, how do companies trust each other? Um, and then the question around data operability and linkage between data sets becomes a big, big question. We've just heard why perhaps Australians aren't using uh, the EPIC data set from Wisconsin. Um, I think we'll get some of those same questions around how do we trust integration with a private company's integrated data set. But this is the way of the future. We will see uh, curated, valuable data sets being built, and I'm interested in the panel's view around how do you imagine a future where you are looking to work with and integrate some of these data sets that are not within the tight control of your own institution's self-trusted uh, research environment. So who'd like to chime in first? Uh, Bernie and then Dougie here. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question, and it's complicated. Um, um, I think one, it's very appropriate that we're in the building that houses the law school um, and at University of Melbourne because um, one thing that came to my mind immediately was um, how different jurisdictions in the world are dealing with this. And probably the most prominent example we know of is the GDPR in Europe. Um, and if you look into the GDPR, and I'm, by the way, no expert on it, but um, one of the key principles is informed consent um, for use of personal data um, that is written in plain language. Um, and also the, the ability to, um, for participants to control the use of that data going forward so that they can remove the data from studies and so on. So I think that um, those principles, can, you, if, if you look in the literature, you, you typically people will say there's sort of three mechanisms at least that we can use here. There's sort of the legal mechanism, there's policy, and then there's technology. And we've been talking a lot about technology today. Um, but, through the trusted research environments. Um, but there's also policy, and policy actually comes into play significantly when we're talking about the um, commercial use and these direct-to-consumer related genomics technologies. 
Um, and again, it changes depending on where you are, are in the world. In, in North America, the, the laws that govern direct-to-consumer are different than those that for research and different for those that are clinical as well. And that's again different in Europe. In Australia, um, again, not being a legal expert myself, um, but we're many people are probably aware that the, the Privacy Act in Australia is one of the key pieces of legislation that covers some of this um, in Australia and actually there was just a review about that and many individuals here and, and throughout these institutions would have contributed to that feedback and if you read the, if you read the legislation it's, it's, it's difficult for the legal system to keep up with all of this um, because it changes so rapidly. And a lot of the terminology is from genetics, where we're studying a gene or a location or a locus, and now we're talking about the entire genome. And not only the entire genome, we're talking about the genome of millions, hundreds of millions of people, potentially, the, the population. Um, and so, again, maybe getting back to a point before, is that thinking about all of the different expertise that's needed to bring to this, it's, it's just so critical that we have all of that discussion together and we don't have a technology organisation or a commercial partner all independently working on things need together. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but to say that actually um, it is useful to look around the world and see what's happening there. Maybe see, okay, what's happening in Europe? Is that a, is that a sign for what we might be heading towards in Australia in the future? Yeah, uh, it's, thanks for sort of raising that, that you've got these different levels with, you know, what is the law around this? What's policy? Where's, what's trust? Um, uh, because the reality is that, um, uh, you know, if you look at commercial organisations, you're, you're having to make sure that you, you have that trust with, with your customers. And that's really absolute. Um, if you look at legislation around things like record-linked research and how you can conduct it, um, there aren't... Let, there are ways to do things safely, and there aren't actual legislative absolute barriers stopping this from happening. So that trust in the right platforms is really important because it can happen. And if you think about secondary uses of data, um, it's very difficult to get some form of opt-in consent. You know, if I want to look at population-based stuff on patients from the mid-1990s, some of them are dead. For goodness sake, you know, but we need to understand what happens to people. Um, so, you know, I'm a big advocate for improving mechanisms of consent. There's no question about that. In fact, even in this building, dynamic consent, uh, people from this law faculty were amongst the first to define dynamic consent in conjunction with their colleagues at Oxford. So, we know there are some mechanisms to advance this. And I think we should certainly pursue those because that's about building that trust. Um, but I think the secure research environments have got uh, certainly a place in that. So we've heard uh, governance mentioned a few times. So there's governance around the secure environments. Um, uh, but bear in mind, there's a, there's a, there is a separation there. There's secure environments as a, tech, as a platform where data goes. And then there's governance <laughs> around the data that might, that might actually go into those, it's just, which is a separate thing. Uh, so I think for Telstra, you're having to deal with both, in effect. Um, yeah. So that's what's happening there. And with our team, we've got, we've got our um, general practice data set of about 5 million patients, and we've got some from our independent data governance com uh, committee here in the audience, which is consumer-led. I can see I Sam over there. Um, so all of these different components are really important. I, I, I think trust is the most important thing, what we can do in that space. Um, yeah, Charmaine, do you want to comment on this industry question too? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess from an industry perspective, yes, it's trust, but it's also the legal, <laughs> what our legal compliance is as well. And so the reason, you know, Telstra Health, you know, I mentioned earlier, we've got all these different products that span the, span the patient care continuum, you know, so we can follow patients, you know, from primary care, hospital care, um, into, the, into the aged care facility, pharmacy. So we've got access to all these individual software, even within, within, the, within the same business. However, um, you know, we don't have that consent across all these platforms to, to use it for secondary purposes. So we ourselves have to develop that right of use across these platforms in order to, 
you know, link them together if, if there was that need. Um, so, so it is a one by one consent um, process for each of these platforms. You know, it's, it's all there, but um, it is developing that right framework, consent governance framework in order to, in order to realise that opportunity. Yes, and we've seen that as well. So we've had to have contractual agreements with the practices <coughs> and how that works on behalf of their patients. But I think the key things here is, is um, trying to get over that there isn't an absolute legislative barrier to it. It doesn't mean to say it's not a lot of work, though. Yeah. Jim, did you want to add something here? Yeah, thanks. It, it, it was a great question. I, I guess at a macro level, that tension is increasingly being recognised. In the last 12 months, the National Institute of Health has set up the NIH Foundation largely with a view to how do they set up and to a certain extent govern public-private partnerships, uh, and not just around the use of data, but primarily it was set up, as I understand, with the thoughts around data collaborations. In my area of vaccine safety, clearly there's both the money and data-rich pharmaceutical companies, and then there's other, other groups, and clearly for a group like mine who may need to come out and say vaccine X is either safe or not safe, to have a financial relationship with pharmaceutical companies is unacceptable for multiple obvious reasons. And so to have a framework where you're able to perform research together and have a respected body govern that relationship um, is going to be increasingly critical as time goes by. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, another question uh, that's come in from our online audience. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, this is a question which was, was asked earlier on and I've been holding it back a bit, but I think we're now at that point be useful to, to quickly drop it in because I think there's quite a few people that are uh, certainly in the online audience are interested in this is there are quite a few trusted research environments in Australia and examples are Erica, Shure, um, SERP, uh, Keypoint, things like that and the question is do they differ from each other and do we need many of these? Is there somewhere an index of these? So uh, 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 yes I'm intrigued to hear the thoughts from the maybe the, the panel or the audience on that. Yeah, let's start with the panel, but I know we've got people in the audience that may well have a perspective on this as well. I'm looking at some of my Monash, Monash colleagues here, but let's start with the panel. Uh, how many of these do we need? Is one enough? Do we need 10? How do we enable integration, operability? How do you feel about multiple secure research platforms? Dougie? Start, yeah. I guess. Well, wouldn't it be nice if there was just somewhere you went and, uh, and it was all safe and done? But I think, as I was mentioning earlier on, I can't really see it, it happening. But I, I guess uh, from a commercial perspective, companies have got their own uh, commercial imperatives. But certainly universities and hospitals and so on have their own imperatives too around looking after their data. So I think that's probably the biggest driver for multiple uh, but it doesn't mean to say that everyone needs to run their own. So we've got platforms like Erica potentially that could be run more centrally, um, uh, and there are others. Uh, so I, I, I guess the challenge, as I mentioned, is that there isn't actually a tight definition of what they are, I suppose. Um, uh, I suspect they've all got very similar capabilities, but there's not actually a definition. Maybe one for the RDC that's got an accreditation on on uh, what constitutes a secure research environment. But don't put the burden on us uh, poor uh, uh, providers to actually get certified. <laughs> no, I'm only joking, but you can imagine the challenge there. Um, yeah. Well, I, I know we've got, um, certainly at, at Monash, we're using um, Monash Secure e-research platform, um, but we have the Helix technology platform work as well and clinical registries and trials. So I wanted to invite some commentary. I know we've got at least three from our Monash community here in the room and wanted to hand the microphone over perhaps to David um, to sort of talk about a bit of compare and contrast, but certainly what you're experiencing in in delivering a platform at Monash. Um, thank you, David Powell from Monash eResearch and uh, Helix. So uh, I am now responsible for the SERP instance at Monash. Uh, I don't have an answer for that, that around <laughs> how many we need. Same deal, it would be nice if there was uh, one solution. There are differences as far as I can tell. Um, and so a healthy ecosystem makes sense. Um, but that answer of what should a TRE look like I think we all need help with that because uh, I was just told that there is this problem. We have researchers 
which have data in three different uh, TREs and they can't move it between them, which does hinder research. Uh, how do we solve that? I don't have the answer. Is that a common problem? I know we've got a number of different institutions represented here in the room, but, but are others of you experiencing the challenge that your researchers are having to access multiple different secure research systems? I'm seeing some nodding going on here in the room. Anyone want to share the, the challenges with what that means for themselves? Jim, how about you? Um, so I guess at the moment we have it was gross hypocrisy on our part, so we have to access data from at least three different TREs and we're looking to access a fourth, but we're also looking to create our own, um, which should round out the fingers on the hand nicely. Um, I, I think inevitably, I think some level of standardisation and harmonisation and I if we can move towards, at least in many aspects, common data models that will facilitate an easier interchange between these platforms. I, I, we're in the law building, I'm not familiar with jurisdictional law, but we are a federation and I think at least compartmentalisation, at least based on state-based privacy laws, etc., are almost inevitable. Whether that can actually be partitioned in a federal resource is a possibility, but I. I'm not technical enough to understand that, but I, I suspect both for industry-related reasons and federation-based reasons, it's inevitable we're going to have multiple and we need to figure out how to harmonise them as best as possible. Yeah, thank you. Um, I know that uh, the AIDC has been spending a lot of time thinking about different research data commons and we're here talking about people and people platforms. So I wanted to invite Adrian perhaps to give some commentary from an ARDC perspective of things that are going on in the context of people, but particularly in this broader context of health and medical research data sets. So Adrian, thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. Yes, uh, the ARDC is launching a new five-year program really dedicated to the health research community and what are the national scale uh, infrastructures that we can provide. And as we've seen today, it's such a, I think Rosie called it wicked, and I'm going to keep telling her that, um, that we need wicked resources here, Rosie. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that across the, the very nuanced uh, health service providers, state, federal governments, increased facilities, MRIs, universities, uh, private companies, uh, ARDC is not going to do all of that, that's not our job. We are a digital and data national capability and we are looking to join up uh, the activities across uh, that nuanced uh, landscape. Uh, the 4.5 challenges that we're really um, putting out there are data strategy, you know, is the data that the researcher needs there you know, to, in order to address dementia or diabetes, etc. do we have a data strategy for that? Um, is it discoverable? You know, uh, is the data from Western Australia uh, as easily accessible uh, to someone from Victoria uh, otherwise? Then the, the next challenge after that is our trusted research environments. So we have a whole challenge you know, over the next five years dedicated to this area. Uh, and then once you've got it, then you're trying to bring data sets together uh, in data integration and data analytics. So we are looking to uh, operate some light touch national services in those areas and do a lot with across the health system to provide coordination and coherence. So um, to come to the trusted research environment challenge that, that we, uh, we, um, we have been doing a consultation over the last 18 months and have got that message very clear that there doesn't seem to be any way to just have one res secure research platform, as convenient as that might seem. Mm -hmm. And we were possibly at that stage five years ago where we were thinking, oh, that might be where we would be now, but uh, there are just, there are lots of drivers to have lots and uh, multiple custodians need to have different control. And then 
multiple researchers needing different uh, access and they're being funded uh, at smaller levels as well. So given that, we, uh, we've got two big programs that we're looking to uh, launch over the next months, uh, over the five-year period. One is a national framework for uh, trusted research environments, so responding to a lot of things that you were just saying there. You know, how could we, uh, even if it's being done in different places, what are the common features? How would we even de define one? Even if I was going to say, yes, you could use mine, uh, what is yours? You know, so even to have that interoperability and federation conversation, we have to have a common notion of what it is. So anyway, ARDC will be resourcing that uh, national conversation and we hope that that would end up in a framework that touches governance, technology, integration, um, some of the social aspects as well. And then the second phase of the program would be us looking at the research system and saying, okay, what does a network of these things look like and where would ARDC be resourcing uh, where there are not environments and we need them to be or resourcing some of the interoperability with the private sector, for example. So uh, the second stage would be resourcing that. So uh, in the end, we, we do this for the researchers. So you've got to put yourself in the shoes of the researcher to say, you know, it was... Um, Nicole, who was saying that over tea, you've got one research project, the data is now in five different places. The tools are in a sixth uh, place, and uh, then the resort, the computing resource is somewhere else. So um, the reason why AIRDC is getting involved here is in order to bring some kind of co coordination and coherence for the, the researcher or the policy maker that needs to ask questions about data that's in these environments. Great. Thanks very much, Adrian. Lots of food for thought there. And Thank if you. anyone would like to uh, help us at the ARDC doing that, we are hiring <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually, it's a good segue into, into the closing question I'm going to ask each one of our panellists. I mean, I'm going to go in reverse order from the way you presented. So I'm going to start with you, Bernie, and then maybe we'll just work our way down. Uh, down the panel, but but my closing question for each one of you, and and you know keep your answer relatively brief if you can. Um, the closing question, and having just heard what Keith has just uh, sorry, that Adrian's just described with respect to AD, ARDC plans, um, if there is one thing that you could improve in the environment in which you're working in the institution and group that you're in, one thing that you could improve, what would it be? I want to say, um, more money please, um, <laughs> but I won't say that. Um, instead, what I would like to say, one thing to improve is, I think um, due to the nature of Australia, the way that it's a federated country, as been mentioned already, um, it's distributed by large distances and so on. Um, bringing this together in a national um, program is critical, as I mentioned that already. And, and so I think um, just stimulating that national engagement across the board, bringing people together, we are, we are, I wouldn't say this is not happening at all. It is absolutely happening at the moment. Um, and so I just want more of that to happen. And, and I, if, if one thing could, could really go quickly, that would be my, my first preference, would be to try and bring the national agenda together as much as possible. Great, thanks, Bernie. Jim, what would you look to improve? I'll keep it short, whatever it takes to improve interoperability. Yeah, Charmaine. Um, I'd really love to see a shift in the, dis, um, in the conversation from discussions about data sets, data linkage, mega data sets, um, to what are we doing with all this data and all these different data, secure research data environments? You know, how are we going to action those insights? Here we have a software vendor with you know, up to 50% reach into primary care where we can action those insights that are found in research. Why, you know, why don't we talk about what are we trying to achieve with these linked data? We've already got insights from research. You know, we know that there's a 20 year gap from, from, um, to translate research into application. Let's try and test some of those some of those findings um, within a within a software vendor that's able to action those findings within the software without extracting data outside of the system. So I'd really like, love to see a shift from um, 
gathering research insights to actioning those insights and testing whether they're actually working in real reality. Thanks, Charmaine. Dougie, how about you? So I think back to that focus with, uh, you know, thinking about the RDC. So it's really challenging from a provider perspective to uh, try and have a process that works efficiently to get access happening fast. So certainly uh, trying to address efficiency is a really difficult thing in this space. So that'd be really good. Um, but I'd, I'd also like a barrack for uh, what Jim was saying there around interoperability or things like common, common data models. There are other ways we can access data without having to release it. Um, but sure, I mean, sometimes we do have to link it to answer the question, I'm afraid. But so I'd like to think about that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, th thanks very much. So, yeah. so you've heard some interesting insights. Mm. I mean, if I just try and wrap up some of the conversation that we've been having this afternoon, I think we've heard about lots of examples of how institutions are building and delivering trusted research environments. There isn't one size fits all. There are lots of different options. I, I think we also heard that we don't necessarily understand the pros and cons of one approach versus another. We just know that there are lots. We've got examples of institutions where there are multiple different trusted research environments that researchers are having to think about. How do you integrate across? What are some of those interoperability challenges? Um, a lot of dialogue around the role of Australia Australian government guidelines. Um, Australia is a collaborative nation. How can we integrate and work more effectively together? Um, the need for data privacy, the need for informed consent. So there are both, there are lots of challenges and opportunities that we've heard this afternoon. And so uh, as we think about the future, the opportunities for us to be able to continue to innovate around these trusted research environments are tremendous, but we have to be able to innovate. And that does open us up to the conversation around globally, what are global best practices? How do we think about sharing data? Are we willing to share data outside the shores of Australia? And, and if so, under what conditions? So a lot of really interesting dialogue and rich commentary this afternoon. And so I'd like to thank the panelists that have joined us for this great discussion today. Uh, Dougie, Charmaine, Jim, and Bernie, and invite all of you to join me in thanking them for their contributions. Thanks very much. And before we wrap up, I'm going to hand over to Rosie Hicks for some closing remarks. Thank you, Rosie. I have to do this bit because otherwise who else thanks Joanna? But I'll get to that in just a second. Um, I do want to echo uh, the thanks to all of you in the room for this afternoon's discussion. My thanks to all of you online, whether you're live today or watching this uh, subsequently. I really hope that you've heard something this afternoon that changes the way you think about this problem. Because if you have, then we've succeeded. There was a comment that was made to me as we were gathering at the start this afternoon, that all too often these groups, whether it's researchers, whether it's industry, whether it's government, come together within their silos and admire the problem. And I believe the phrase that was used was an echo chamber. I can't remember who it was. Was it you, Dougie? Was it Jim? Yeah, Jim. <laughs> the echo chamber. And what we really seek to do with the ARDC leadership series is to break out of our own echo chambers, bring all the groups together for a rich and uh, informative conversation that can change what we do next. Now, I know that you're all with me on that journey. Uh, we give our thanks to the panel. A special thank you to Joanna. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to all of the ARDC staff that make the series possible. Asha, thank you at the back of the room. Your hand on this is so obvious, um, but also a quiet hand to those that don't get recognition every day, 
but as such an important part of the ARDC team as we move forward with these programs uh, so that we can enable Australian researchers through world-leading knowledge infrastructure to transform our lives. Thank you.